All right, uh, thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited to be in Krakow. It's my first time. Um, I need to start with a standard medical warning. My brain believes it's 3 a.m. right now, so uh, anything could happen. Uh, so uh, this is me, I'm Jabe. Uh, this is my blog if you want to look at what I've written before. Uh, if you want to send me anonymous feedback and tell me uh, terrible things about how, how much you dislike my talk, you can send them here and I won't know who you are, uh, absolutely anonymously. Um, I love Twitter. Does everybody have a phone? If you have a phone, please tweet during the talk. I find that actually people um, can summarize me in 140 characters better than I talk, so I, I really love to see what people write after the uh, talk. So Citane and uh, AceConf is the tag that we're using today. So um, this is my job description. It's a little different than other CTOs. Um, the, way I just, the way I describe my job is to say that uh, I envision the types of technologies that teams may reasonably be expected to produce in five to 10 years and to prepare those teams to envision, create, and produce, create, produce and support that technology. So I think the top of this is kind of the standard CTO thing. It's the bottom that I think is a little strange. I spend a lot of time thinking about teams and how to organize and structure uh, teams so that they can uh, better produce the technology that we're going to see in the future. Uh, and today's talk is going to uh, really focus around uh, how, how I think we're going to have to change the way we structure teams in order to be able to keep up with the speed of change in technology. So, the talk is called uh, The Value of Sitting with Strangers, which you guys are all doing right now, so that's, it's good, and I'll explain that. And, and the, the things that we're going to cover today, we're going to explore the nature of knowledge work, which is what we all do. Uh, we're going to talk about teams and flow-based systems. We're going to explore the ACE knowledge network really quickly. And then I'm going to introduce several options for open space style to increase your blag. I finish, didn't finish that sentence, sorry. Um, anyway, so to increase your, 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 uh, your, the goodness that you'll get out of, out of your open space sessions. So, uh, just to start with, let's set some context. Um, this is kind of how I think about Lean and how I think about where we are in Lean. Uh, we started back with Adam Smith and Taylor and Gilbreth, and we really were focused on how to make people more efficient at work and how to make them more productive. So these guys were really focused on things like how to reduce the number of keystrokes or how to, how to get somebody to move a brick from one place to another quicker. Um, and that enabled us to do uh, really amazing things uh, and produce a lot of new uh, material-based uh, value. So then we moved into a, another area of kind of lean thought, which was flow and effectiveness with Ford and Ono. Um, and really, the difference here is that we started kind of going away from just manufacturing physical items and starting to looking towards the balance of knowledge versus a physical item. So when you're making a car, Ford in particular was making one type of car and teaching people how to use one type of machine. But instead of making things like pins, he's making cars, so he needs to manage the flow of the parts into the system. Oh, no is then dealing more with how, how do you create variable systems? So how do you create different types of cars uh, with different parts and what are the problems that happen with that? And we move forward and uh, Womack wrote a book, um, The Machine That Changed the World, and coined the term lean, uh, which, is, which is what we use today. Uh, and then Poppendeck, Lattice, Benson, Anderson, and Reese have recently started talking about lean software. Um, so, I think if you look at this, one of the things you'll see is that really what we've been doing is we've been moving from low variability with Adam Smith's idea of the division of labor, producing simple objects, simple items, uh, towards Ford where you're producing more complicated items, uh, but really kind of homogeneous parts and homogeneous uh, products, and then into Ono where we're talking about now we're creating some variability in our products and we have more heterogeneous parts. Um, and so we have different problems with flow and controlling flow. And then finally up here, where we are right now, which is that we're massively increasing the variability of our systems. So what we produce today um, is almost always unique each time we, we, we produce it. So the increase in variability is really one of the key things that we're trying to try to figure out. Um, 
So Buckminster Fuller uh, described this, this evolution and this way of thinking about variability uh, as ephemeralization. And basically what Buckminster Fuller uh, uh, argued was that every year we get better and better at producing more and more value with less and less material. Um, and if you think about it, what it means is that we're moving away from physical items and producing more and more information. So the value uh, in, in our systems is moving from the physical objects into the information. So uh, one of the ways I, I often explain it is that if you look at um, this object, it's, it's becoming more and more ephemeral because it used to be that I had buttons on this object and I couldn't change it. But we, we're more and more, we can late bind information onto our objects so that they become less and less about the physical object and more about the information that we can display on the object, right? Um, so ephemeralization is, is constantly producing more and more options for us uh, for less and less value. And this is, a, I, I love this picture. So this, this is, uh, he, he called these stars. And it's a perfect example of what he meant by ephemeralization because his idea was, this is a, 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 a tensor grid, so it's the minimal amount of physical structure he needed to create a sphere, and he was going to fill them with helium, and they would float above the, in the atmosphere, um, close to, close to the uh, top of the atmosphere, and, and monitor the planet from there. And so it's this idea of creating maximum structure with minimal amounts of physical objects. So, working used to be, you know, back, uh, when we were talking about Adam Smith and the division of labor, about creating physical objects, right? So creating something that anybody could look at a pin as it's being manufactured and see whether or not the pin was in the right condition for the current phase or current step that it was in. Um, the other thing is that you could have a rigidly defined boundary between the different steps, and you could identify, you could uh, look at it and see whether or not the object was on spec. Each, each step, right? Uh, but now uh, we're moving away from that, and instead of having, instead of controlling the work uh, and the context of the work, including the teams and processes, we need to figure out a, a different way to work. So, uh, when I think about knowledge work, I, I was I was in the uh, MoMA the other day, and I saw uh, Mary Mary Vigman, and Mary Vigman was a dancer, um, and. She uh, had an interesting problem. So she's one of the very first modern dancers, and she abandoned the language of ballet. So the interesting thing about abandoning the language of ballet is that um, ballet for years had a very highly structured language, and the value of that structured language was that you could choreograph, as in I could tell someone else what to do because there was already a language, right? So Vigman gave up the language of ballet in order to have a more natural expression of dance. But what she lost when she did that was the ability to communicate her choreographed pieces to other people. So you had to watch her or she couldn't explain it, right? So Vigman was obsessed with this problem and she worked with her, uh, her mentor and partner, Rudolf Laban. And you can see in the background here, they created a language based on uh, musical notation, okay? To to completely capture the way the human body moves. And so this is, this is a, a Laban notation, right? It's kind of cool. Um, so does the, who wants to dance it for me? <laughs> right, so the interesting thing about knowledge work, and this is a, one of the first problems about knowledge work, is often when we create new forms of uh, uh, ways to capture knowledge, we only create more experts, right? So now they have a way of capturing uh, dance, but now you need a Laban notation reader in order to understand how to actually use it. Now, this is very rarely used anymore because now we just videotape people and we show them videos of each other dancing and you can learn from that. But back then, this was the only way you could do it. So one of the first problems with knowledge work is just literally being able to transfer knowledge from one mind to another. Um, and this, is, I think, was a, an interesting example of that. So. I'm going to show you something, and I want you to silently, in your, in your head, uh, say what you see. All right? Everybody ready? You got it? Everybody raise your hand. You got it. Yeah? Good? Anybody need it back? Okay. All right. Stand up if you said B in your head. 
Everybody clap, because they're right. Yay! All right, sit down. <laughs> Stand up if you said 13. <laughs> Yay! So this is the other problem with knowledge work. Um, and uh, this is from an experiment by Kahneman, and, and he calls it the effective context on accessibility. Um, really what this is, is it's, a, it's only a two-dimensional problem, right? So it's either you know A, B, C, or you know uh, 12, 13, 14. So it's really only two-dimensional, the context in this place. But often when we're exploring new problems, we're trying to solve new, uh, new space, information spaces, we, aren't, we have like massively multi-dimensional context, right? So we, we actually, when we try to communicate to other people, we're not even sure what pieces of context to communicate to them in order for them to understand what we're talking about. So it's really easy to think that you, that obviously I'm talking about B, and the other person thinks obviously he's talking about 13. So the second part of, 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 uh, of knowledge work is that the context that we work in become very critical for actually transferring the information. Uh, and it's not easy to get around that. So the last piece is, uh, was, is just by Fred Nichols. And, and it says that the, the shift in knowledge work has snapped the most critical chain in, in the chain of command, which is supervision. So actually being able to see what people are doing. So like uh, I actually have in my business, we make uh, material handling as well as software. So we have basically giant um, conveyor belts that move uh, books around. And it's one of the most difficult parts of the business to manage because the software engineers and the guy who makes the conveyor belts don't get along because the guys who make the conveyor belts can see how far along they are every day. They just go, well, it's almost done. Let's see it. And they're always like, well, what, software people, why can't you tell us how much you are done or not? Like, well, because I, it's partially in my head and it's partially on the paper. Uh, it's not a physical thing. Um, so this is uh, the other piece of knowledge work that I think that we have to get better at, which is, uh, is kind of disambiguating these separate pieces, which is work is not working and it's not the worker, right? So most of the way that we usually talk about work is that we talk about processes for making things. That's how we think about working, right? Um, and I think that one of the things that we have to acknowledge uh, as, we, as we move forward and we, we rely more and more on humans as opposed to the objects they're making, we need to realize that humans have some significant issues. Uh, they have a bounded ability to perceive the world that they're in. They have a bounded ability to understand each other and the context that they're in. And they have a bounded sense of rationality. So uh, these things over here affect their ability to effectively use processes and create processes um, and affect what, what kind of output they, they create. So customers um, are adopting disruptive technologies faster than companies can adapt. So I think that this is, this is uh, the problem that, uh, that we all have to face as far as how we are thinking about creating software and the teams that create software. I wish I could see my slides a little better. Okay, so, um, and this is, this is, I think, uh, this is the problem. And I think that that, la that last stage that we're talking about, so when Womack was, uh, and, and that area of lean, we were talking about kind of traditional knowledge work, which is, uh, tends to be more about this part of knowledge working, right? So it's the, how do we teach people the processes that they need to in order to create artifacts, right? That's the traditional knowledge worker problem. I think that this is creating a different type of knowledge work problem. Um, and I think that Stowe Boyd uh, describes it pretty well. And he says, and I'm sorry, there's way too much text on this slide, but anyway. Uh, we are seeing a transition from process-defined work where tightly defined rules and narrowly constrained roles shape people's working lives and organize the company culture into a collective mindset. So defined work, tightly defined uh, rules, narrowly constrained roles, and collective mindset, right? And instead, we're moving towards. So this is the new type of knowledge work that we need to be able to address, which is a relationship-framed workplace uh, where people use creativity, innovation, and connection to determine, to determine so it's an active process how to accomplish increasingly non-routine work and where 
we see a shift from fast and loose cooperation from tight and slow collaboration. So one of the things that I see when I talk to a lot of teams is that a real effort to do this without a real understanding of how to do that. So uh, often I see teams trying to do premature collaboration. They're trying to uh, narrow their, their option set by collaborating too quickly, right? So uh, we need to figure out how to do the cooperation part better, which is working with each other as opposed to um, directly with each other, right? So this, I think, is, is, is an example of the type of knowledge work we need to be able to address, and it's the emergency room. So if you think about it, when someone comes into the emergency room, there isn't a, like a predefined rigid set, a, a rigid team structure in place to accept them. The question is, what kind of injury do they have? Who's available? Emergent team comes into place, they take care of the patient, they bring in the necessary resources and knowledge when they need it, um, and they don't have people waiting in reserve for these things, right? They, they have to emerge it on the, on the spot. So Amy Edmondson, uh, who's a Harvard professor who's been studying this a lot, calls this concept of working uh, teaming. And she says teaming is a verb, it's an activity, it's not a thing. So uh, the traditional concept of teams tends to be um, like sports. So you have a sports team, they're pretty rigid, they're pretty, they're structured, there's a quarterback, he has a particular role, people don't move around very much. Um, you don't have like an emergent football team every Sunday, you have the same team every Sunday. So she's saying teaming is, is something that you actually do. It's a dynamic activity and it's not a bounded static entity. Um, and it's largely teaming, the activity of teaming is largely determined by the mindset and practices of teamwork and not by the design and structure of effective teams. So this down here, the design and structure of effective teams is the way that we've been structuring teams for a long time, right? So you can think about the traditional uh, way that I, I get pushed back when I talk about this is that people say, well, I have to have a team because there's the norming, storming, forming, like we, we've invested so much in getting the team to work together um, that they, we can't separate them again, right? So, but Amy Emmons is saying that one of the skills that modern knowledge workers need to understand and need to be better at is how to form teams quickly. And not only how to form teams quickly, but form them with the right level of structure so that they can last as long as they need to and not overinvest in creating structures so they last longer than they need to. Right? So one of the things about change and the rapidity of change that, that uh, Dave Gray was talking about is that it's really crushing all the cycles that we're all, all, all used to. So uh, it used to be that you could take six months, a year to build a piece of software. Now there's people in, in you know, Silicon uh, Valley who want, who want to do releases every day. So the, the, the cycle times are really getting tight. Um, and this is the way that I get my teams to think about this problem. Um, I ask them, what, what, what would we do if we had a bug that was killing 10% of our customer base every day? What, how would we, what kind of capabilities do we need to address this defect? And it's a capability, so it's not the way we want to operate every day, but the question is, could we address this? And how quickly could we address this? So we're trying to keep cycle times tight, so that we can address problems like this, right? Uh, and it's one of, the, so this is the emergency room version of software, right? So I think if you go back to your teams and you ask them questions like this, you, could, you, would, you would need to structure your teams in the way they work completely differently. So that, a, Amy Edmondson says, in fast moving work environments, uh, you need people who know how to team, people who have the skills and flexibility to act in the moment of potential collaboration when and where they appear. So one of the things uh, that, that we see when we try to do real knowledge work and real innovation work these days is that there's a lot of weak signals. So there's a lot of, of, of uh, work that we need to be able to react to very quickly in order to establish whether or not the, the, there is value available. And Static team structures make this very difficult to do because people tend to get into static team structures and then they get dedicated to a single product or a single idea and then we can't move them around quickly enough to actually uh, do this. So 
some of the skills that we need to learn is the ability to recognize and clarify interdependence, establish trust quickly, and figure out how to coordinate, right? So these are the types of skills I think that we need to start addressing. Teaming uh, blends the relate, uh, I can't read that way, I'm gonna read this way. Teaming blends uh, relating to people, listening to other points of view, coordinating actions, and making shared decisions, right? So uh, we need to uh, use teaming to expand knowledge and expertise so organizations uh, and their customers can capture value. So. Emergent teams, I think, is, is, is one of the critical ideas that we need to start exploring as a community. And this is really one of the main advantages of having emergent teams, is that they make experience, skills, and knowledge available on demand, right? So, uh, uh, and, and teams that have these abilities, or, or organizations, or structures that have these abilities, have significantly higher uh, levels of uh, resilience. So why, why do I say that they, they have these things? Well, we, we talked about earlier knowledge is hard to move from mind to mind. If we have loose structures so we can move the right people together, we don't have to move the information around quite as much. We just move the people around, right? Um, so uh, the traditional way of trying to deal with these issues of experience, skills, and knowledge is you ask people to write it down so that you can basically time shift them, right? Uh, but that, as, as we've seen over the last couple of years, really doesn't work very well. So, the other part about, uh, about being able to use dynamic teams is that when we talk about dynamic teams and dynamic structures, one of the critical things we get is larger amounts of creativity, because creativity largely comes from having uh, disparate views come and touch each other. So, Having people think different ways, coming and looking at the same problem is where we actually get those sparks that allow us to have more creativity in our, in our workforce. So um, it's almost impossible to uh, overrate the value of placing human beings in contact with persons dissimilar to themselves, right? So if, if that's really valuable, how do we create structures uh, that allow us to do that? So, the other thing that we need to learn is that managers need to adapt, and anybody who's heard me talk before know why, knows why I have this quote in here, because it's got the word ambiguity in it. I just am a sucker for that. But managers must adapt to the ambiguity of flat organizations, right? So the difference is that managers uh, used to be able to use uh, positional power, and now with these dynamic structures, uh, they're going to have to rely more on negotiated influence, right? And negotiated influence in this, in this case it, um, is a very specific concept. So the specific concept is this. Um, if back then we were talking about capital and that's where most of the value was when we were investing. So when we invested, we were investing in machines and factories. Then we moved towards human capital, which is uh, where we get human resource, which is a terrible term, but the idea that what you need to own as a business owner is, is, is in people's heads, and so you need to structure that. To intellectual capital, which was the kind of more of a recognition that there's some uh, part of it that's not just the people, it's the information, so we need to have information systems. And to finally, to social capital. This, I think, is, is what Stowe Boyd is, is really talking about, which is that what we're investing in now is not only the networks of people in our organizations, but the ability uh, to dynamically create those networks in ways that add value to the organization. So, Bert, um, who wrote a book on, on uh, social capital, says uh, human capital, um, the human capital explanation of inequality, so that, that kind of that human resource idea, is that uh, the reason why some people make more money or, or get special favors is because they're better, right? They're, they're more intelligent or they're more attractive. And one of the things that we're, we're figuring out, and there's been some great studies about this in law firms, is that social capital explains far more than raw intellectual power or any of the other things, right? So you take a very successful lawyer in one firm, you remove him from that firm and put him in another firm, and his performance will almost certainly go down. And that's because part of his value is the social network that he has in the organization. And so starting to recognize 
that real value comes from having people who do have these skills and, and properties, but also understand how to connect dynamically with the right people. Social capital, it, that's the trick, right? So um, I, I, I was at a conference uh, last Friday, and, and someone had this joke that said, basically, complexity theorists would rather share um, toothbrushes than their definition of complexity. Um, social scientists are like this, too. So there's like dozens of definitions of social, uh, social capital. Um, but this is the, one of the simpler ones. Social capital can be measured by the amount of trust. So we can say, roughly, that social capital is an agreement to reciprocity. right? And, and trust in this way is this idea that I'll do something for you now without expecting you to immediately pay me back with some understanding that you'll probably give me something of value back in the future. Um, social capital is, is also thought of in organizations as an active connection among people. Um, and it's important to understand that one of the things that it does is it makes action possible. So uh, social capital is kind of like a, a lubricant that allows your organization to actually do things. Uh, and by that I mean, in, in the case of dynamic uh, teams and dynamic structures, uh, if you have more trust of the people around you, you're more likely to work with them uh, without objecting to it. Uh, when we see highly siloed organizations, we see low social capital, right? So we see people are like, I hand my work over that wall, and I don't really care where it goes, um, and, because I don't really trust them, and they don't really trust me anyway. So what we've done in order to deal with that lack of trust is we've created really rigid specifications that define how we interact, right? Social capital, like all other forms of capital, um, is productive, right? Again, so um, it allows you to do stuff that if you didn't have it, you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, the other definition of social capital that's really important to understand, especially for managers, is that uh, Social capital can be defined as the advantage created by a person's location in the structure uh, uh, of relationships, right? Um, and the advantage um, is visible when certain people or certain groups um, are able to do better than equally able peers, right? So this, this is the problem with social capital that you have to be aware of and you have to be careful of, is that in dynamically structured environments where you have people moving around more freely, it opens up an opportunity for a, a special kind of abuse, which is people putting themselves in positions of power where they regulate information flows. And that actually gives them um, unfair advantage over people around them. So it's something we need to watch out for. Um, and the, the best way to describe how to, how to mitigate that is to actually make sure that you uh, work to replace authority, traditional authority with respect, right, and reputation. Um, so these are the, the different ideas about how you might think of social structures. So inside of teams, you have very tight bonds. Um, and then across, across some teams, you can have tight bonds. Um, and across some teams, you can have weak links, right? So we, uh, a tight bond might be these guys, work, these are two different teams, but they work across a common interface uh, at pretty regularly. The weak bonds might be uh, that they, they have friends on the team, so they talk to each other. And then finally, we have this one. And this one is, uh, is, is a gap, right? It's called a structural gap. This is the gaps that allow people to show up and create brokerage positions. Uh, not all brokerage positions are bad. But this is the type of gap that allows people to take advantage of moving information from one team to another. And so this concept is called broker. Uh, and the brokers have interesting uh, powers, right? So they have access to alternate opinions and practices and early access to new opinions and practices. So because they're in between teams, uh, they get to see th these teams over here are evolving some special practices and, and techniques. And these teams over here are evolving some techniques. And I can actually take techniques out of this team and apply them to that team, or move special information from one team to another. And that is uh, brokerage. So that is the ability to broker information. Um, but the other side of it is, is birds of the feather, and it's called closure. So closure is uh, that 
teams will form and naturally create um, protective boundaries around themselves. And these boundaries, and closure in general, are what establishes the trust. So it's actually what allows trust to move across your organization. So um, here's the interesting part, because uh, you're trying to balance these two things constantly, like most things in life. Um, what this graph basically says is that when you have highly closed networks, your performance will do drop. So networks, full networks with lots of closure. Uh, so stru rigidly structured networks have low performance. Um, uh, networks without as many uh, constraints and with more structural holes um, have much higher performance. And the other problem with this uh, that this indicates is that there's a power law involved in these uh, problems. So uh, the first couple constraints that you put on your network are the most damaging. Um, so this is the other way to think about it, um, which is punctured equi uh, equilibrium. Uh, so remember we're talking about uh, creativity, and creativity is, is having different viewpoints touch each other. So one of the things we can be able to do when we're creating teams is actually separate them and not allow them to talk to each other so that we can actually create those moments when we bring them back together. And that's the moment we get those sparks of creativity. And punctuated equilibrium is, a, is an excellent example of that. So all the, all the snails know each other and are, they're all the same. Something breaks them, so we create a special team or, or something like that. So we have the general population special team. That team accelerates its evolution because it's in isolation and they become radically different. And then when we remove this boundary, we get a crossbreed of these different ideas, right? So one of the things about dynamic teams is we need to be able to separate teams have them isolated from each other, and then bring them back together again effectively. So processes that allow for deferred commitment enable dynamic restructuring. So one of the really key concepts, I think, to understand is that um, if you are committing large teams to large periods of work, it's impossible to restructure them, right? So what we want to do is we really need to carefully crush our cycle times down so we have more optional moments to restructure teams and then allow the teams to restructure themselves. So a couple little uh, few slides here. Uh, John Seeley Brown, the change in the patterns of participation um, and you change the organization. So if we change the way that we work together, we'll change the entire organization. And really, what we're tr the period that we're entering, I believe, uh, is, is one where uh, participation of the knowledge worker and what's in their minds is, is, is really one of the most critical parts. And here is, I think, the, the, the law, if we have one, uh, that, that, is, that points to why we need better, better dynamically structured teams. And it's Conway's law. The Conway's law says organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So does anybody out there want a rigid, immobile architecture? Right? What we want is flexible, modular architectures that we can swap pieces in and out. Right? That, if we want those types of architectures, if we want the, our code to reflect our culture, we need our culture to start correct. We need, we need to understand how to create teams that are dynamic and flexible and modular and small. Fred Brooks, um, reflecting on Conway's law, says because the, uh, because the design that occurs first is almost never the best possible, the prevailing system may need to change, and therefore the flexibility of organizations is important to effective design. So when we think about applying this to organizational structures and the way that we structure teams, what we need to figure out is better ways of allowing people to structure themselves. So at TLC, uh, these, are the, these are the principles that we use to allow people some better dynamic uh, uh, stuff. People who operate under their own autonomy are more likely to care about their work and notice and react to changes in context and be innovative. So we try to push decision making as far down in the chain as possible. Uh, it's not always possible to get it all the way down, but as far down as possible. 
The shorter distance between relevant information and people making decisions, the better likelihood a good decision will be made. So since it's hard to move knowledge work around, it's hard to move knowledge around, try to make the people who have the best understanding of the context the people making the decisions. When innovation is required to solve novel problems, diverse perspectives allow organizations to see around corners. We, we uh, have an idea of, of not only dis distributed decision making, but diverse decision making in our organization. So one of the things we do is the, the traditional agile concepts, which I just kind of described, which are we try to push decision making down in the organization. The second thing that we do is that we actually try to get teams to work on the same problem from different angles. So actually, how do you have two teams work on one problem and come up with multiple solutions for it? So diverse decision making to allow us to kind of look at problems from multiple perspectives. I had the same slide twice. Uh, faster cycle times drive dis distributed decision making. Faster cycle times mean taking less big bet risks, so we try to eliminate big bets as many uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and combined with customer interaction, faster cycle times result in higher quality software and higher customer satisfaction. It's time for some experiments. You guys ready for some experiments? Okay. So the first one I'm gonna teach you guys is called mic check and it's so I can control you when you're done. Um, so what I want you to do is I want, uh, when I start humming, when you hear me hum, every, when you hear the guy next to you hum, start humming, okay? And then the trick is this, when I raise my hand, when you see the guy next to you raise his hand in response, stop humming. We're gonna, this is gonna how, how we're, I'm gonna control whether or not you're talking, so you ready? All right, ready? Everybody raise their hand, stop, very good. So that, so if I say mic check or I raise my hand, just raise your hand and stop talking, okay? I need a volunteer. Toby, you want a volunteer? Awesome. Okay, so you guys out there, we're gonna do the exercise. You, you guys do what, what we do, make sense? So I'm gonna do it with Toby, you guys do it while you're, while you're watching, all right? So you've got your supplies already. So I need a pen and your green sticky, please. All right, so here's your first mission. Draw a robot that represents you. You have two minutes, or no, let's do, uh, you have 30 seconds. Everybody good? Raise your hand if you're done. Raise your hand if you're done. Hurry up. I'm running out of time. All right. Okay. So explain yourself, Toby. I want to see your robot. Show me it. Yep. Yeah. What, 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 why is that like you? Quick feet, excellent. Yeah, yeah, it's like running. So cool. it runs around through the game somewhere. Well, it runs, that sounds just like you. My robot has its eyes closed because it wants to be asleep right now. Oh. All right, so turn to the stranger next to you and explain your robot to them. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. All right. Does everybody? Does it? If you have a cell phone, please take it out. 
If you have a cell phone and you have a camera app on it, please open your camera app. Toby, will you take a picture of me with my robot? <laughs> Can I, I'm going to take a picture of you with your robot, OK? Awesome. I think that's how, yeah, I got it. OK, so Toby, will you tweet your robot to everybody for me? Hand your cell phone to your neighbor. Have them take a picture of you and your robot. All right, so when you guys have pictures, get your phones back and tweet them to Ace Comp. Good? Everybody good? You guys can tweet tweet away while we're doing this. Toby, we've got to do another exercise now. So that was excellent practice, guys. You did a very good job. Thank you very much. You ready for the next round? OK, the next round on your yellow sticky. So you're going to have three yellow stickies, right? I want you to answer a question. Now, I want you guys to be careful not to be too general with these questions. So. Uh, don't say something like, I like cars, say I like Mustangs. Or don't say I like food, say I like boiled eggs, right? Uh, be, be more specific than general, um, all right? So Toby, um, this is what we want on our stickies, OK? We want three words only on each sticky. No more than three words on each sticky. And we only want one idea on each post-it note. We don't want all of our ideas on one. So we're going to have three different stickies. And each one's going to have one idea on it that's three words or less. Yeah? Cool. All right. So, Toby, if I asked your friends what three things would they say you know a lot about? Can you guys do that too? Three things your friends would say you know a lot about. How'd you do, Toby? You all right? All right, Toby. This is the three that I picked. So I, I said that I think people would say I know a lot about whip limits, social capital, because I just did a whole talk in front of 200 people, and then complexity. What, what did you get? I said right shifting. Right shifting? Yeah, that's definitely you. Kanban. Kanban, yeah. And ultra run. Awesome. All right, so can you guys turn to the stranger next to you and explain the three things you know the, that your friends think you know about to your, your stranger friend?
All right. We're almost, we're almost there, Toby. We almost got everything done. Almost. But we have three pink stickies, right? I have three pink stickies. You have three pink stickies? So here's, here's the last thing that we have to do. All right? So again, let's, let's not be too specific. I mean, let's not be too general. Let's try to be a little bit specific, all right? What are three things you should know more about that you know very little about? What are three things you should know more about that you know very little about? Ready? It's a hard one. Because, but it, so you don't want to balance. Like it's stuff that you know you should know, but you just, you know you don't know it. It's not the unknown unknowns. It's the known unknowns that we're looking for. That's right. No, no. We, we're just going for the stuff we know we should know. I, yeah, I'm thinking of them on the fly. Isn't that dumb of me? Um, yeah, I should have planned. I, not only that, my brain is really tired. Um, I, I'm going to make one up that's silly, but we'll, we'll go for that. All right, so Toby, you good? OK. <laughs> See, he's even slower than I am. He slept. All right. So, Toby, I said there are three things that I don't know enough about that I should know enough more about is Monte Carlo simulation, right shifting, which I should just know more about. I know a lot about, but I don't know enough. And robotics. I'd like to know more about robotics. I would like that. I would really like that note. Robotics. That's great. Robotics. Yeah, cool. Yeah, robotics. Okay, you want to hear mine? Yeah. Yeah, so I said one on one coaching. One-on-one -on -one coaching, cool, yeah. That would make me even more effective, I guess. Uh, Large-scale improvements, ah. because I can do small-scale, yeah. uh, but I haven't worked with a large company yet. Cool. And anthropology. Anthropology would be awesome. That would be, yeah, awesome. Cool. <laughs> All right, guys, your turn. Tell your stranger friend what three things you should know more about. All right, guys, we're almost there. So, Toby, you and I have our stickers on our badges. Can you guys put your stickers on your badges like this? Just They have to hang off the bottom, they're a little bit too big. And I didn't put my robot on here. You have your robot on here. It's better than I am. I don't even know where my robot went. That's a bummer. I'll have to find him again. Oh, I think he's right here. I got him. I got him. Okay, uh, Toby, can you can we do the cell phone thing again? Do you remember how to do that? So you're gonna give me you're gonna open your camera app and uh, give it to me, and I'm gonna do the same thing. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna take your picture first, okay? Or you want to take my pictures? I, I think if we maybe put put it by our faces so that people can see. Trying to make sure. Well, you, you know, you want to frame the whole thing so you get their face and the notes, yeah? Is it your turn? Cool. All awesome. So uh, when you get your pictures, tweet your pictures to AceConf Ideas. There are 10 minutes left.
you get it tweeted? How you guys doing? Good? All right. So I did a little math. And uh, we got three pink stickies times 230 people. That's 690. We got three uh, yellow stickies. That's 690. We got 230 green stickies. We got 1,600 stickies. So what, what are we going to do with them? This is what I do with them in my organization. That's, I, we make lots of stickies, and then we try to figure out what they mean. So immediately after my talk, don't all rush back there at once, but please take your stickies and randomly place them on the back panels in the back of the room. Everybody see these panels back here? Turn around and look where my green laser is. Those panels, you're going to stick them randomly all over those panels, OK? Now, over the next two days, during coffee breaks, you can come, and I will be back there, and I will take teams of up to five, up to two teams at a time, and we will start trying to figure out what all these notes mean. And since it's right next to our uh, open space market, hopefully, Toby, after the first uh, coffee break, people will be able to go there and go, hey, you know, all those yellow stickies are things that people know. Oh, you can pair them up with, purple, with pink the, stickies. The pink stickies are the things that people want to know. So we could try to figure out how to structure our open space based on what we know and what we want to know, right? And we, I also have, by the way, Toby, I have these dots. And so if people see clusters of these ideas that they really like, they can put dots on the clusters. And that would indicate they would really like to have an open space about that. That's so awesome. Cool. All right. Thank you, Toby. All right, guys. Um, how to rock an open space. I have exactly six minutes, so I think I can get this done. First of all, uh, build social capital, right? So we just all met a stranger, somebody we've never talked to before. We've just created closure inside of our networks. And we've all tweeted pictures of ourselves to each other so we can see what each of us knows and what each of us wants to know. And we all know what we look like as a robot, which is just pretty cool. You can run your open space as a lean coffee. And I think this is pretty awesome. If you are asking a question, so if you're doing a, uh, I, I've forgotten already. If you're doing a pink sticky type style, like you want to, I would like to run an open space to understand Monte Carlo better. You could use lean coffee. And lean coffee works like this. You sit down and you say, Here's my Kanban board. Here's the things I want to discuss. Here's the thing I'm discussing. And here's what's to be discussed. You get a, a sticky pad. You put the three stickies up there, or you just draw some whip columns. And then uh, you put on the post-it notes, everybody who's in your Lean Coffee puts what they'd like to talk about. So we're doing Monte Carlo. So everybody would write down what they want to talk about about Monte Carlo. Again, you can use the same rules. Three words to a sticky, one idea for sticky. Then once everybody's done writing, it takes about five minutes, everybody stands up with their stickies and they put them on the board in the to discuss lane and they say, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do this. Then you dot vote each of the stickies and then you talk to the ones that get the most votes. Finally, uh, uh, Jim Benson, who uh, made up uh, Lean Coffee, uh, just ran an open space in Vietnam using this idea. And what they did was, when they, when they were, had the open space, when they did the talk, they would take the stickies back to the uh, marketplace and put the stickies on the marketplace so people could see what they had talked about. So if you do an open space with a lean coffee style, take your stickies off the board and bring them back to the marketplace so people can see what you talked about. So things I love about lean coffee, uh, do you guys, this is a really common experience for me. You sit in a meeting, and if it's like the traditional meeting, you kind of sit there and you have something to say, and you're just waiting for the moment to break in, and you're not really listening to what's happening, right? You're like, um, the really cool thing about Lean Coffee is it pulls everybody's need to tell everybody else what they want to know to the very beginning of the meeting. So you actually flush out of your head all of your stuff that you want to talk about at the beginning. And then you actually listen to what other people are saying for the rest of the meeting. Awesome. All right. The other one you can do is an experience report. So if you, if you have an experience that you want to tell somebody about, 
I suggest this structure for it. Spend no more than 15 minutes at the beginning of your open space using Cobb's theory of experiential learning. Now, this is how he, ex he thinks you should learn, but I think it's also how you can do an experience report. So first thing, tell people exactly what you really did. Try not, uh, not too many opinions, just what you did. And then after that, say what you thought about what you did. So I did this thing, and then I stopped, and I thought that was cool. And then tell them what, you, what, uh, what kind of abstractions or theories are appropriate for understanding that experience. And then finally say, this is what we're going to do in the future when we have that event, when we have that type of experience. So you say, I had this type of experience. This is what I thought about it. I did some research, and these are the theories I came up with. And in the future, I'm going to do this. Yeah, that's a great format for an experience report. Finally, the story. Uh, stories are great, uh, but I want to make sure that you guys use the narrative form well. So the classic narrative form is called the hero's journey. You get some call to adventure, so some challenge that happens. Uh, and you go through, and you, you have a, 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 a real challenge, achieving that challenge, and then you finally succeed. Now, the importance uh, of the narrative is this. I love this quote. What fairy tales, tales uh, give children is his, uh, his first clear idea of the possibilities of defeating a bogey. Uh, the baby has known the dragon intimately ever since he had an imagination. The fairy tale provides for him, what, what the fairy tale provides for him is St. George to kill the dragon. I think when you're telling stories, it's really critical that you explain the roles involved. Because what you're trying to do in a narrative form is say, if you ever see a dragon, here's how to kill it. Like, here's what it should feel like, and this is what the knights feel like, right? So when you tell stories, try to keep the whole arc together and explain the different roles that are in it. Well, that's an extra one. These are my influences for this talk. And I would like uh, a brief personal moment, which is um, thank you, Paul, for having me. Um, but when, I, when I, Paul invited me, I didn't know if I could find a sponsor to sponsor me uh, to come to my flight. And I told my parents about the conference, and my parents sent me the money to go. So my travel has been sponsored by Drown Valley Farm. And if you enjoyed the talk, please consider thanking Dr. and Mrs. Bloom by tweeting at Brown Valley. Thank you, Mom and Dad. <laughs>